all right, why don't you go and try this environment for a while? How would you like to go looking for an environment? Fine, you say, but where should I start looking? Well, you won't have to look very far because one is around you right now. Now, remember our definition of science? We said that science was a study of things and forces around us. Environment, then, is these very things and forces around us, or your surroundings. I think I could describe your surroundings around you today. There would be desks in the room you're in, books, a TV set in the room, and there would also be a certain amount of heat in the room which uh, would make it comfortable. All these things are part of your environment now. But other living things have things which we call factors in their environment also. Things such as soil conditions, heat, cold again, the climate. All of these things would be part of their environment. Now I think that you could say that one of the more important factors in an environment would be food, wouldn't it? Mother may send you to the grocery store. And in going to the grocery store, she may say, get this list of groceries so we can have dinner tonight. And she'd fix them for dinner. But animals living in the wild can't go to a restaurant or a grocery store. Instead, they have to find their food in the area in which they are. And food can originally be thought of in terms of a green plant. I have a green plant here. Suppose we talk about it in terms of what it does for food. This green plant does these things. It takes the energy of the sun and with minerals from the soil, water, and carbon dioxide, uses the energy of the sun to put them together to form food and also living material. But suppose I use a diagram to explain what I mean. I have over here a circle which we will let represent green plants. There are certain animals which eat these green plants and they would be called plant eaters. There are other animals, however, which do not eat green plants necessarily, but instead live on the flesh of other animals. And so we could call these animals flesh-eating animals or flesh eaters. But some animals, you say, eat both, green plants and flesh. And so we would let that rep be represented by plant and flesh eating animals. Now let's review quickly what we've said. Green plants are eaten by plant eaters and plant and flesh eaters. Plant eaters would eat only green plants. And I wonder if someone could tell me which animals flesh eaters would, would eat. Well, they would certainly eat plant eaters and they would also eat these plant and flesh eating animals, wouldn't they? Perhaps I can show you a better demonstration of this by using some specific plants and animals. Let's begin with our story with a common farm plant. I'm sure all of you have heard of this one. Let's let this represent a corn plant. And the corn plant, in turn, may be eaten by an unwelcome guest of the farmer, a grasshopper. The grasshopper, in turn, may be eaten by a frog. The frog may become food for a snake. And the snake may become food for a hawk. 
Now I think that you realize that we could go on and on with our story and have the hawk eaten by a bigger animal and a bigger, bigger animal eating the bigger animal that ate the hawk. But suppose we stop here and think about the hawk getting a disease. And perhaps the hawk would die from the disease. Now what is it that causes disease? Well, bacteria is one thing which can cause disease. And these bacteria serve another purpose. Besides causing disease, they also take the dead bodies of animals and return the materials that were in these bodies to the soil and to the air. Now let's review quickly, if we can, just exactly what has happened here. We have taken from the air and soil minerals, water, and carbon dioxide, and put the two of them together with the energy of the sun to make living materials, haven't we? The energy which was stored in this corn plant, uh, the sun's energy really stored in the corn plant, would be go to the grasshopper when he ate the corn. And the frog, incidentally, would get a hold of uh, some of this energy when he ate the grasshopper. The snake would get the energy when he ate the frog, would go to the hawk, and the hawk, when it died, the energy would go to the bacteria, and the materials would go back to the air and the soil. But I think that you should realize that this cycle, which we've drawn here, it's a complete cycle, may also be shortened. For instance, the corn plant may die. And in that case, bacteria will work on it to tear it down, to return it to the air and soil from, from where it came. And likewise, the grasshopper could die and its body be consumed by the bacteria. And the frog could, be, could die and its body be returned by bacteria, likewise the snake. I think you can see that the cycle may be large or small depending upon the area. I'd like to ask a question. Have any of you ever heard of the dynamics of nature? Sounds kind of difficult, doesn't it? Really, it's something that has a pretty big sounding name to it for something which is real simple. Perhaps I can show you an example, and then later I think that uh, you'll know what I mean and be able to define it yourself. Recently, in an area in northern Minnesota, northeastern Minnesota, in St. Louis County, there was a number of skunks living in the area. In the same area, there was was a number of turtles. Or let's let it re these number of turtles repre be represented by this one turtle we have here. And there was a large number of ducks. Now, the people in the area decided that they wanted to get rid of the skunks for a number of reasons. Number one, they thought of the skunks that as being not too welcome friends because of the odor that they could give off. And also, there's a possibility that they could carry disease to the animals in the area. And so, a trapping campaign was put on against these animals, and slowly the skunks began to disappear. Now, one of the very favorite foods of the skunk was turtle eggs during the summer. More of these eggs hatched out and the turtles became more numerous. And one of the very favorite foods of turtles, incidentally, was baby ducklings and for the bigger turtles, even the larger ducks. And so the little ducklings and even some of the larger ducks began to disappear. This, I think, illustrates the dynamics of nature. The fact 
man can upset these this dynamics often without realizing it there is another facet besides this dynamics of nature which I think you two should know about and this involves the competition of animals for food suppose I show it by this diagram that I have made in this diagram you can see on your screen a small figure at the bottom which will represent microscopic life in a pond this will represent perhaps millions and billions of tiny little microscopic animals now these microscopic animals I will say are much larger in number and as we go up to form a complete uh, pyramid we're going to find that they're going to increase and so we find that the number of fairy shrimp which could eat the microscopic animals would be less wouldn't it the fairy shrimp eats the microscopic animals and they are not fewer in number than the microscopic animals below it the fairy shrimp may be food for some very small fish again you'll notice that the area is smaller and that these these uh, small fish would be fewer in number than the fairy shrimp below it and these small fish which could be hundreds in number could perhaps be food for just one fish at the top one large game fish now this large game fish is the kind of fish which we like to catch isn't it what would happen if in the essay area we wanted to plant many 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 of these big game fish I think that you can understand what would happen first of all all of the the food in the area would be eaten up very quickly wouldn't it because there would not be enough for these small fish uh, for these larger fish in the area so we find that competition would certainly be uh, important because it, we have to have enough food for the life that we want to raise in the area now we've talked so far simply about food I wonder if we could talk about something special about our environment which would involve adaptations to environment now adaptations it could sound like a big word to some of you but what we mean by adaptations is that the animal is able to live better in its environment with this adaptation something which enables an animal to live better there are two kinds of adaptations one the animal is able to adapt quite readily and the other is the kind that they're born with both of them they're born with but one the animal can change and the other the animal cannot most of them are of, of the kind that the animal can't change they're simply born with it I have over here two little fellows I wonder if anybody can tell me just exactly what these are they're chameleons and I've got them in this special environment when you saw me put one in at the beginning of the period I put them in this special environment for this reason one of them I have on very dark paper the other one I have on lighter paper and these uh, tiny little chameleons are able to change their color suppose I take one out and put them together and perhaps you can see uh, some difference in color the one at the top of your screen then it, it, whoops they fell down together maybe I should boost them up again he wants to uh, hang on to me here whoops whoops I guess we can't keep, get them up the one incidentally at the top is a brown and the one at the bottom is green but I said that most animals do not have the ability to change their conditions as these chameleons did and instead they are born with the adaptations which they have I'm going to show you one which also is an adaptation to color which these animals really can't change 
I have a fish here, which, if I hold it against the dark background, I think that you can see that the top part of this fish is dark in color, while the bottom of the fish is light. Now, if we look down at the top of this fish, from above into the river or the lake in which he may be, we would find this fish would resemble very greatly the background in which he's swimming. However, if we placed him in it and looked at a, a light surface, you'd find that the bottom part resembles this light surface, and this would look somewhat like the particular uh, background which you would see looking from underneath him towards the sky. I have some other pictures that I would like you to see of these special adaptations that animals may have for protection. This deer that you see in this picture is a special adaptation of speed, uh, able to run away from his enemies uh, very readily. This animal also has a special adaptation of speed. The rabbit is fast over short distances, and this particular rabbit has another adaptation of color. He is able to change his color somewhat from the winter to the summer. During the summer, he's brown, and this snowshoe rabbit during the winter is a lighter shade. This animal has a special adaptation of odor. If an animal ever comes around him, he uh, could, uh, the animal in this question, the skunk, could uh, uh, get rid of a little odor uh, that would chase the animal away. And so uh, most of the animals in the wild stay away from the skunk because they don't care for this odor. There is one which I'm sure uh, is a special adaptation that you didn't think about. This is a crayfish. And it uses these pincers for protection and it also uses, it has a hard shell which it uses to protect itself on the outside. This turtle is able to protect itself because of its shell. When an enemy comes near, pulls in its legs and its head and tail and crawl, goes inside of its shell. Should we go back and review for a moment? First of all, we defined environment. We said that environment was the study of the surroundings. And then we went on to say that food was a very important part of that environment. And we showed that competition was important for the gathering of food. And then we've gone on to show you some special adaptations which animals have uh, for protection, protective coloration speed, a protective covering in the case of the crayfish and the turtle. All of these things are special adaptations. You may be interested in doing some special work uh, on some special adaptations such as food gathering that animals may have and also on some adaptations that the animal may have to climate. Or there may be others that you may be interested in. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions and let you answer them. Take them down, will you? In this case, what special adaptations would be necessary to live in these environments? I'll explain them to you, but I think the slides will show what I mean. This is an Arctic-like environment or the cold snow. What special adaptations would an animal have to have to live in this environment. This is a desert environment. Extremely cold nights, hot days, very little water. What sort of adaptations would be necessary to live in this environment? This is a water environment. We have a pond, ducks flying over it, there would probably be fish in the pond. What special adaptations 
would you have to have to live in a water environment? This is a forest environment. You see a deer, a tree. What special adaptations would be necessary for an animal to live in this environment? And we have here a very special environment of a prairie environment. Very little shade, grass. What special sort of adaptations be necessary to live in this environment? I hope that today you have seen some of the special adaptations that animals must have to live in their environments and you've also seen some of the special conditions which are necessary in an environment. I hope that today we have answered the question, how are animals dependent on their environment? You have been viewing Science Grade 7, a telecourse presented by the Minneapolis Public Schools. Your teacher today has been Richard F. Rumpy. Subject Area Consultant supervised the planning of each series, which is authorized by the Advisory Committee on Educational Television. Teams of teachers assist in the planning and evaluating of the various lessons presented. Series are produced through the Radio Television Department of the Minneapolis Public Schools. Directed by Louis House.